はい。<laughs> you know, variables the same as what sometimes called snake fermions or snake boson. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, I mean the word. So first of all, we stopped using that term, uh, <laughs> but it, that term was used first in the context of condolitis models, which I, I will get to soon. Uh, in this context, they tend to be called stringer bosons. <laughs> Okay, so good morning. Can you uh, hear me? Hyderabad? Or... Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, hello. So here's a summary of uh, where we were last time. We're considering some class of antiferromagnets. Uh, these are spins on some lattice with spin uh, orange S, angular momentum S. Um, and today, in fact, we'll consider some general set of lattice, with, but with translation invariance. So I've just written some general coupling J I J. Uh, and the way we proceed to solve this problem is by using the Schrodinger fermion representation. We decompose the spin uh, in terms of the spin a half bosons. There's two of them, uh, S up and S down. Um, and there's a constraint on every side that uh, the number of the Schrodinger boson is always an integer. Uh, so we may need to this half case, so this would be one. And then I showed you through a series of manipulations uh, that you could read out the path integral uh, of this problem as a path integral in terms of two auxiliary fields that we're going to play with today. Uh, one is this bond field, and every bond is a QIJ field, which is a complex number. Uh, which is conjugate to this particular combination of the sink of the Schrodinger bosons. And it, you can just see that this is an operator that annihilates a singlet pair. So you have a valence bond uh, of the spins, up, down, minus, down, up. And if there's a valence bond, it's annihilated by this operator. So you can think of QIJ as just the valence bond operator, which is measuring exactly how these valence bonds are fluctuating and also the relative phases between different arrangements of the valence bonds. And then we also had to introduce a Lagrange multiplier uh, to impose this constraint. Okay, so then we get, we're gonna get some very complicated action, uh, which is hard to write down in general, but we're going to study it today. Um, and one of its most important properties um, is invariance and gauge transformation. So the first thing we did was just to take this action uh, and look for uh, saddle points that were spatially uniform. And you know people have done that for many, many lattices. And uh, so today we're going to focus on the triangular lattice. Uh, you can get some solution of the Qs, which we'll call Q bar and lambda bar. And then about the saddle point, if you look for the Hamiltonian for the original S bosons, and then after a boggly work transformation, uh, you got another boson gamma alpha, which was in 
uh, eigen operator of the Hamiltonian. Um, and this gamma alpha created a bosonic excitation that had an energy gap uh, and that carried spin a half. So this is in some sense already quite a exciting uh, discovery here. You've got an excitation that carries spin a half. So it's a fractionalized excitation. Uh, you know, and it's very surprising even for, even though the spins here may be spin a half, even though this orange gas may be a half, we haven't yet met any other system uh, which has an excitation which has spin a half and also charge zero. So the electron, of course, is an excitation in a Fermi liquid that carries spin a half and charge one. But here we're finding kind of a violation of the usual spin statistics relation. Uh, so you have a half integer excitation, which has zero charge. This doesn't carry any charge at all. We haven't even mentioned the charge of the electron. Uh, and that's surprising even for half integer spin antiferromagnets, uh, because uh, here this is measuring a difference in excitations, differences in spin. So we have the ground state. Uh, now the ground state you know, may have spin zero or spin a half, depending on whether there's an even or odd number of spin a halves uh, uh, in the original Hamiltonian on the lattice. Uh, but the differences uh, between energy levels is always an integer, integer spin. So if you had an odd number of spins, the energy levels would have spin one half, three halves, five halves, and so on, all of them. So all excitations will have integer spin. Uh, and so surprisingly, we have found an excitation which has half integer spin. Uh, so that's quite remarkable. And of course, the only way this can happen in any finite system is these are created in pairs. You can create pairs of them and separate them out to infinity. Um, and for these, sometimes it's called spin charge separation. You've got a half integer spin with no charge. And uh, you know, spin waves in an antiferromagnet or spin waves in a ferromagnet all carry integer spin. So there's no problem getting integer spin with zero charge. Paramagnons, all these objects have integer spin and no charge. Uh, but this is the first time we've met an object that has half integer spin and no charge. Uh, and in this manner, we call this uh, the spin on. So that's the word I'm often going to use. Um, there's also a connection to uh, the toric code, where this is the analog of what uh, we call the E particle. So this is a bosonic spin on. That's All right. So that's already a nice story, uh, but we now still have to do this pad interval, which is what we're going to turn to today. Okay, any questions? Yes. Um, there's no claim that this is a superconductor as it stands, right? Oh, no, not at all. It would require doping or something. That's right, that's right. Yeah, if you dope this uh, and you have motion of uh, charge, um, then this particular pairing could combine with other, uh, you also have, also have to end up condensing something that carries charge and the combination can lead to uh, uh, superconductivity, yeah. I mean, and, and that in some sense is uh, in broad terms and this is original idea that the singlet bonds in the liquid like this would turn into Cooper pairs once you allow them to actually move around and carry charge. Any other questions on Zoom? Okay. So let's uh, now forge ahead and try to do this path integral. Uh, in general, that's a very complicated task. Uh, and in some cases, that's still a topic of current research. Um, but for this, for a particular case, uh, you can make a lot of progress by, you know, by a certain set of very reasonable arguments uh, which give us greater understanding of the structure of the space. So, so the first thing you can do is look, look at perturbative fluctuations. So this means you take your Q uh, from Q bar and you change it a little bit. And you take lambda uh, from lambda bar and you change it a little bit. Okay. Uh, so we looked at that last time, towards the end of last lecture. Um, 
And uh, that's already a complicated task, but we uh, gave rather general arguments that on certain lattices, uh, in particular on the triangle lattice, um, these fluctuations are also gapped. So they don't give you any uh, um, they don't give you any new very low energy excitations. They'll give you some other particles that will carry spin zero. And in general, you would think those particles would probably decay into a pair of the spin-ons. Uh, so there's nothing fundamentally new really uh, there. So, so we, we look rather safe and maybe we have indeed found a theory uh, in which there is spin charge separation. It's been a half excitation with zero charge. Um, okay. But that's not sufficient. You really have to do better. Um, you also have to look at non perturbative uh, corrections. So we're going to go to beyond perturbation theory. We have to look at new saddle points and we have to sum over all of them. Um, and we have to make sure uh, that that summation doesn't lead to any fundamental instability. In fact, so that's the task we're going to embark on today. Um, and we'll find that's indeed the case, uh, that this, this thing is, looks to be non perturbatively stable. And one of the outputs of that we'll also discover uh, when it does become unstable. So eventually, uh, there'll be a phase transition to another phase of matter uh, where these fractionalized excitation, the spin ons, uh, get confined. Uh, so that's uh, so. So we'll have a deconfinement to confinement transition, and the confining phase will then, in some sense, be a boring phase because it will not have any half integer spin excitations. So we want to describe that too, and see if there's any general constraints, uh, and then what happens to this phase that we're uh, discovering. Here. Okay. So so the first step there is to look for new saddle points. Sorry. Yes. What did your motivation for selecting this particular saddle point? Was it just a special uniformity or? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, uh, I think, yeah, you can certainly look for non uniform saddle points. They, they generally will have higher energy. Right. But well, we're going to pick out a particular set of spatially non uniform saddle points soon uh, because, uh, as you'll see, they have the potential in them to, to eventually destroy. Uh, this particular uh, saddle point, this particular phase. But there'll be a finite range of couplings that we don't. And that's something we can pretty argue pretty strongly. Okay, so, so to understand the structure of other saddle points, uh, in fact, the simplest place they first appear uh, is on a torus. So take the system and put it on a torus. Okay. Here's a torus, a very big torus. Uh, and so it has circumferences, which I'm going to call L. That's the length of the circumference of a torus. Really, I should draw it in a plane. It's a plane here. And I'm identifying these boundary conditions. So this edge is the same as that edge. This edge is the same as that edge. Uh, and, and we put you know, solve the equations in this plane with periodic boundary conditions. That's really all we're doing. Okay. So we found in the infinite plane that the lowest energy saddle point was Q equals Q bar uh, with, you know, with some orientation of the arrows on a given triangle and so on. Now we just take that solution and put it on a torus. And now my claim is that there is another saddle point uh, which has almost, in fact, three other saddle points have almost exactly the same energy. Um, to say that, let's first uh, write down schematically of the structure of S. And I won't even ignore, I'll ignore lambda for now. So S of Q, you know, has various terms, but the kind of terms you're gonna need, well, first of all, there could be some potential, which it depends on the Q on a given length.
and it would be uh, some time derivative terms like this. Uh, in fact, I'm going to work in a gauge where I fix lambda to be time independent. I can always choose my role so that lambda is time independent. Uh, and then this is also gauge invariant. So I'll only be thinking about time independent gauge transformations. Uh, and then I can get uh, various terms, some over loops with some coefficient, CL, a product on QIJ belonging to a loop. So it will be Q, Q star, things like this. Now, one important feature of this theory, so where have we got all these terms? Well, these all these terms come from, in a sense, from doing the path integral over the S. I do the path integral over the S, uh, and I put in various source terms with Q and Q star, and I just integrate over the S, and I'll generate some effective potential for Q. Uh, now, the most important property of the S is that they have an energy gap, one of the important properties. There's some energy gap here. So as these look bigger and bigger and become bigger and bigger, um, I can see that the C sub L of a length of loop of length L, this is a different L, let me call it. Okay. Uh, C sub L will decay exponentially roughly. Uh, where this delta is the energy gap. And there's some velocity which is about one. Okay, so the bigger this loop becomes, because the, the things we're integrating out are gapped, uh, these, the coefficients of these loops, loops become smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, so well, that's a very important quantity that we need. Okay, so now let me show you another saddle point on the torus which has almost the same energy as the infinite lattice saddle point we found. Um, but all of them are slightly different because they're not torus, actually. Uh, so I'm going to draw a cut here. Let me choose a different color. Okay, so this is some cut through the lattice. I mean, there's actually a triangle lattice here. Uh, here, let me blow it up. And then I draw a cut through the lattice, which cuts the bonds in any, any path I want, um, but it encircles the toss. And then I do the following. For every QIJ that cuts the bond, so there's some QIJ here. So Q is I, this is psi J. If it cuts the bond, then I'm going to say that QIJ goes to Q bar, the infinite lattice value, times minus one. I'm going to flip the sign uh, of the QIJ on every QIJ that cuts this orange line. Okay. So now why am I doing this strange thing? Well, the first thing, important thing you should now know is that for almost all loops, this has absolutely no effect. Because if I take any loop here, L, uh, if I take any loop on the lattice, it's going to cross the dotted line an even number of times. It's going to cross it once here and once there. So for essentially every term in here, there's no change in it. It doesn't even know the branch cut is there uh, because there's a minus one here and a minus one there. So, so in fact, even though it looks like this branch cut is visible and it's broken the transformational symmetry or broken the full symmetry of the torus, it hasn't. Uh, it's in fact, as if it's not there, at least locally, because these loops don't change at all. So we expect essentially the same, the absolute value of Q to not change, at least so far. But there's one special loop uh, or one set of class of loops where things, where things do change. Uh, and that's a loop that goes around the cycle of the torus. There's a loop that goes like this, around the cycle of the torus, come back the other side. And what you notice is that it only cuts this dashed line at one point. Okay. So, so, so this state is a different state. It's not the same saddle point because there's a gauge invariant object that goes around the other cycle of the torus. Uh, which does change. 
it flips side. But what is the contribution of this, uh, say, this particular loop? Well, that's of length L, script L, and so it's exponentially smaller than L. The C sub L, the coefficient here, is exponentially small. So therefore, up, if you're willing to ignore these exponentials, which are which can be made arbitrarily small, uh, as L goes to this is yeah, as a script L goes to infinity, then the saddle point essentially is uh, is essentially the same, depending on uh, independent of whether this dash cut is there or not. Yeah. Both cycles have like that? Yeah, yeah, oh. order L. Yeah, of course you can make them different. Yeah. Right, thank you. Okay, so that's the, the main argument. And so you can see you can, so now I've got at least two saddle points. Uh, there's a saddle point with no cut, and then there's this saddle point with one cut. Um, it's a completely different saddle point because there is an observable which is different, which is the cycle uh, uh, around, I mean, the loop around the other cycle of the torus. Um, and, and the difference in energy uh, is exponentially small. So what you can say is that the value of Q bar will be the value of Q, Q bar in the infinite lattice. Well, if you re-minimize the value of Q bar in this particular expansion, uh, plus terms which are of order e to the minus uh, delta L. Well, we found another, essentially a ground state, uh, apart from an exponentially small term, uh, which will generically appear uh, in this type of cycle point. And of course, you can put the cut on the other cycle of the torus. You can reverse uh, the role of these two uh, cycles. You can put the cut on the other side and take this Wilson loop, as it's called, on this side. So in the end, you end up with a total of four nearly degenerate ground states. Okay, so that's a very important property here, uh, that on a torus, this particular spin-liquid state has a four-fold degeneracy. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so that's really quite a remarkable observation. Uh, and these kinds of degeneracies were first noticed at least in the next matter, in the fractional quantum hall states of Laughlin, if you put them on a torus, they have similar degeneracies, uh, not the same numbers, uh, but now they are appearing here in this simple spin model in the zero magnetic field with time reversal symmetry. Okay. Questions? All right. So now degeneracies of ground states by themselves are not. That new. If I took an ordinary Ising model or ferromagnet uh, with no continuous symmetry, uh, then you can imagine there are two ground states on a torus, one with all spins up and the other with all spins down. Uh, but the difference between that and this is in that case, you can do a local measurement. You can look at the spins and see how they up or down, and you can decide uh, whether they're all off and you know which ground state you're in. Here, uh, an important point is that there's a fourfold uh, degeneracy on the ground state. On the torus. Uh, and you require uh, non local measurements, very specific non local measurements to distinguish them. So that's the uh, really interesting and important thing here. All the small loops have no difference at all. Uh, it's only if you just happen to take a loop that goes all the way around the system, an extremely long, unlikely event, they were just randomly making loops in a very big system. Uh, only those can tell you what the different states are. Uh, so that's something we haven't met in any, any previous system that we've studied so far. Uh, this degeneracy, which is not associated with any local observation or with any broken symmetry. Okay. 
the, the true ground state's going to be symmetric superposition of the four states. Um, yeah, so in general, what would happen would be something very complicated is there'll be four states, and there'll be some linear combination of the simple states I've shown here. And, and exactly what linear combination they are will depend on various exponentially small terms of the Hamiltonian in this uh, fourfold subspace. Uh, so we are going to see a little bit of that uh, when we get to the gauge theory. Uh, we send the size of the torus to infinity. Then, yeah. uh, what happens to these others? They're still there, but uh, the operator we need becomes more and more non-local. I mean, if we make yeah. yeah, these are. So you know, there's four states here. So I'm just saying on the plane, do we still have a fourfold in our C? In the plane, <laughs> uh, well, that's kind of a singular limit. Friction sectors. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, in the plane, uh, not strictly speaking, I mean, there will be some could be edge contribution that we worry about. It depends on what's happening on the edge. Uh, but on a torus, yeah, there's always a four-fold degeneracy for uh, for any uh, size as long as M is sufficiently large. And then there's a gap of order delta. To all the other states, and this remains fixed. Okay. And precisely what linear combination you get in your energy eigenstates uh, will entirely depend on all kinds of details uh, and various matrix elements between these states, which you, in principle, you could evaluate from here by doing some rather complicated path inverses, <laughs> uh, which we can estimate they are. They are. Uh, yeah, okay. I was going to say something else. All right. Bye. Any other questions? <laughs> All right. Um, right. So there's this non-local fourfold degenerate states. Oh yeah, I was just going to mention, of course, but you know the idea of uh, quantum error correction and topologically protected quantum computing uh, is that you you manipulate uh, the phases with precisely what these states are. Uh, by manipulating and creating them in some, some linear combination. Uh, and what you're then assured of is that that particular linear combination that you happen to create of these four states uh, is stable to all local perturbations because all local perturbation act in the same way to all four states. So it's like a unit matrix in that subspace. So all the noise is just a unit matrix. Okay. Of course, these four are not enough for complete uh, quantum computation. You need uh, non abelian states and so on, <laughs> which people are trying to make. Uh, so, Veer, how do you explicitly construct these states? How do I? Uh, why don't we uh, I'll wait to answer that? Because it's okay. rather complicated to state all this uh, in this particular language. I'm going to simplify it life for us and write down a simple gauge theory, Z2 gauge theory. And then we can see how we construct them in that much in a much e more easier way. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the existence of these four states and the existence of this invisible cut now should give us an idea of how to create uh, another saddle point in the infinite uh, in the infinite lattice. So we're considering an infinite lattice now, <laughs> and this will be a saddle point with higher energy. But what it's going to give us is another particle. In addition to the spin-ons, there'll be another particle we're going to find. So what we do is we take an infinite lattice. And we take this cut, uh, but have it terminate at one point. And really, if the lattice is finite, then it will probably terminate somewhere else. Okay. Uh, and you look for saddle points uh, with this uh, with this kind of cut. And in fact, uh, my student Yeji has actually done this computation on the triangle lattice. We've taken some action like this and minimize it and look for saddle points like this. And now things are a bit more complicated than in the infinite lattice torus case. Uh, so, but one thing you can see that. Even with short loops, there's a, there are now some special loops we have to consider. Uh, if I take a loop like this, 
there's no change whatsoever in the energy for all these loops here. Uh, but there are a small set of loops for which there is a change. Uh, and then those are loops that uh, go around the end of this thing, okay? So what you're going to find uh, is that your Q bar of IJ, and let me call it Q bar M, M meaning I call this point M, this is going to be a particle from the M particle. Uh, so Q bar IJ in the presence of an end uh, will be equal to, you know, approximately equal to Q bar that we found infinite lattice. Uh, far from M, but it's not going to be equal to this. It's going to be different. Take some set of values that you have to figure out on a computer. Uh, but anyway, it's not going to be equal to this. Oh, sorry. That's not exactly right, or not exactly equal. To this. <laughs> and minus one to the number of uh, cuts, um, you know, whether it, cuts this line or not, a given QIJ, if it cuts it, it's one, and if it doesn't cut it, it's zero. So there's a change in the phase factor. But it's not equal to this, so this is close to M. Far from M, excuse me. Um, and, but it's not equal, even the modulus of this, in the presence of M, is not equal to Q bar infinite. Uh, close to M. So there's some region here in which there's some, some many of these terms here are going to be different. Okay, but there's a small, small number of them. Uh, and since these couplings decay exponentially, as you make those bigger and bigger, uh, you can add over all of them, you'll get some finite energy. So this particular region will have a finite energy cost. But this is a still a stable cycle point with a slightly higher energy cost. Uh, there's, a, in fact, an infinite number of them because you can now move this in anywhere in the lattice. So you've got an infinite set of cycle points. And whenever you get an infinite set of cycle points marked by one position, uh, that's what you call a particle. So you can now even imagine tunneling between these cycle points and then this thing can move, acquire a mass, uh, and it becomes the M particle. But we have, if you wish, a cycle point that particle is stationary. Um, it's got a, you know, in time it's, it's sitting there. Um, and with some, you know, you can evaluate this and figure out uh, its energy for being localized at that point. You know, depends, you know, if you think of the fact that the Q bars have changed over some finite region, uh, you can think of that as a zero point motion of the center of this particle. It's not really there because there's a finite region of which the cues know about its existence. So we're undergoing some zero point motion, but centered at this point. Okay. Uh, but one thing you do find when we do the numerical analysis of this, for example, that the change in this region, you know, is in the magnitude, but the cues never become complex. I mean, they could have become complex, uh, but they don't. And so this particular side of point is fully time reversal invariant. So now I'm going to make a, a few statements that some of you may find a bit mysterious. So these have to do with the connection of this particular description uh, to the field theory of a U1 gauge field coupled to a charge two Higgs field. Now that particular theory also has similar saddle points. Um, these are the Nielsen linear male vortices, or you could, uh, called the Abrikovs of vortices in theory of superconductors. And so those vortices have flux, uh, which is half a flux quantum. Uh, but in fact, those vortices break time reversal. Any given, such, any given vortex, either plus half or minus a half, or in fact, any half integer. is an infinite set of such vortices, and any given one of them does break time reversal. So it is in that sense, the mapping to charge two Higgs field plus compact U1 gauge theory is not 
uh, and it's correct, but it's, it's a little subtle. Uh, what you have to realize there is that because the theory also has monopoles, uh, a plus half flux vortex is the same as a minus half flux vortex because a monopole can tunnel between them. So once you include monopole, you restore the time reversal symmetry uh, and you get these uh, vortices, uh, Y zones, they often call it in S matter or M particle in the toric core, which just have the feature that uh, there's, you know, there's an end to this branch curve. Yes. Do numerics show a large, or how big is the region where Q is very small? I guess. Um, it's of order one over delta. Yeah. So the bigger the gap, the smaller the region. Yeah. Okay. So uh, for now, let's just consider this particle we stationary. We're going to talk about how this particle moves next. It also has some very subtle features in its motion. Uh, but let's imagine you created one of these particles by a very clever experiment, uh, and we can look at it. So one way we can look at it is by using the S particles. So we come in and do a different experiment, and we create an S particle somewhere far away. Uh, we create an S particle here. And we're going to take the S particle very slowly by, you know, trap it in some very gentle potential, and we're going to slowly, slowly move that around in a big loop like this. Okay, so I'm sitting out way out here, uh, and my experimentalist friend gives me two samples, uh, and. Uh, Experimenters tell me one sample has an M particle inside, the other one doesn't. So I do the same experiment very slowly of moving this S particle around and bringing it back. And when it comes back to the same point, um, I can measure the, relative, the, the phase of the wave function uh, to the process, uh, to the initial wave function. So I take, I take it in a closed loop, bring it back to exactly the same point, and I do exactly the same experiment in the two samples. And what I'll find is that there's a relative phase difference between the two, because in the sample with the M particle, I had to cross this cut. And when I cross the cut, I'll think of a minus one, because you can see the QIJ, which is, is, is basically the object that moves the S particle from point to point. Uh, it's got two daggers in it, but that's not a big deal because the actual eigenmode, gamma is a linear combination of S and S dagger. It's the only thing that's non-local that can move the S particle. Um, and so you'll pick up a minus one. Uh, so this particular calculation has actually also been done very carefully uh, in the usual traditions of a very phase computation. Uh, and you can indeed show it's exactly minus one. Uh, that's in, well, there'll be references to it in a paper written by my student, uh, Eugene Huff and Matthias Puck. Okay, so I have another, very important conclusion uh, that the S, no, the, the S particle is the E particle, the S boson, right? Uh, I should call it E. <laughs> e and M are mutual semions. Okay, well, at least if I have a stationary M, um, then I can move an E around it and I pick up a minus one. And of course, here it doesn't matter whether I move clockwise or anti clockwise, it's minus one and minus one. Uh, but in the chiral spin liquids or the Laughlin states, it does matter. You get a different phase factor which way you move, it's a complex conjugate, uh, and that's really the essential feature of time reversal symmetry breaking. Here, this is totally time reversal in there. Okay. All right, any questions? Okay, so now let's consider a different set of saddle points which allow the M particle to move. Okay. Uh, and there's just one very important feature that I want to talk about, well, two, two further consequences. When the M particle becomes an actual particle with a finite mass and that can move around. Mm -hmm. 
So for things to move, you have to consider time-dependent saddle points. Sometimes they call instant toss. Uh, but don't worry, I won't actually do any complicated instant toss calculation. We can deduce everything we need to know and various orders of magnitude just by drawing a few pictures. Okay. But just to introduce what an instant on is, suppose I have the quantum mechanics of some particle, uh, H is P squared over 2M plus some potential V of X. Of course, I know how to solve this using usual quantum mechanics and Schrodinger's equation. But if I try to do this in path integrals, um, I can write this as a path integral of dx of exponential in imaginary time. Oh, and the half dx d tau squared plus d of x. All the signs right, I think I do. Okay. Uh, so now let's take a v of x of the following form. So this is our v of x. Uh, and then I look for uh, saddle points of this. And I find one saddle point here and one saddle point here. So there's are two different positions of space. Uh, but as many people have shown, there's also other time dependent saddle points, so called instant dons, uh, go from here to there. Uh, and this gives you the tunneling between these two levels. So instant dons. And I'll just say that describes tunneling. So we know quantum mechanically, there's when you have such a potential, there'll be two states. There'll be the symmetric and the anti-symmetric combination of these two states with some energy splitting. And this energy splitting is given by this instant tunnel, the tunneling from here to there. So there's some very nice lecture notes by Sidney Coleman and many others, other folks, uh, where you can look up exactly how this is done. Uh, since I'm not going to actually do such a calculation, this is really roughly all I need to know. Okay, so now I can do the similar thing here uh, for the M particle. So I have my lattice. I want to draw a careful lattice. And if I look for instant on solutions, I will find solutions. Uh, that's just an insertion. I don't think anybody's actually checked this, uh, where this object is hopping from point to point. Okay, so I have my M particle here. Uh, with a branch cut going out to infinity. And then I can find an instant on solution uh, where it moves here. Okay. And then what will happen to the branch cut? Uh, color, it will, you know, somehow it will roughly be the same here, but it will move to that point. Okay. <laughs> or I can actually even better, just draw it this way. Since it doesn't matter exactly where it is. Let's say it moves there. Okay. <laughs> so I'll get some, some tunneling amplitude. In this theory, we're pretty, pretty confident to be a real number, something very difficult to compute, but it's an instant on which allows this option to hop around. All right. So I got some number, uh, and then I keep doing it and make it hop around, uh, around the loop. So now I had an M particle. So previously I was taking an E particle and moving it on a loop. Here I'm taking an M particle, not moving it around an E particle, I can do that too. And just moving it around one lattice site. And the reason I'm doing this uh, is because this is a, Kind of, there's a very important property of the spin liquid uh, that the ground state has finite density of matter. It has these bosons, S dagger S is 2S. Uh, 
And that finite density of matter does make a difference to the structure of the gauge fluctuations. So here, let's ask what happens uh, when I move uh, this particle back in a closed loop. All right. So, so when I come back, I started, let's say I started here, and then I come back here. Now, the final state physically is the same as the state I started with. So it's exactly what you would do uh, to uh, the computer Berry phase. Whenever you compute a Berry phase, you take something in a closed loop in parameter space. So we have some parameter space and we've taken, which, which we localize this M particle and I move it in a closed loop. And I come back to where I started. The cut still goes around that. But Sorry? The cut, but the cut still goes around that. Side. Right, so, but in terms of gauge invariant objects, this is the same state. But it's, the picture is not the same. So I have to do a gauge transformation to bring it back to the original gauge. Okay. So what is the gauge transformation that we got rid of the accident? Well, it's very simple. What I have to do is take all of these QIJ and flip their side. Okay, on the accident. But another way to say, what is that gauge transformation is if, if I take the S particle over here, which is sitting in the ground state, you take S, uh, goes to minus s on that side. This is the s alpha. I flip s alpha, I do a gauge transformation where s alpha goes to minus s alpha. Then if you look back to the gauge transformation, all these cues will flip side, uh, and then this will be gone. Okay. All right. But the ground state has exactly two s bosons on each side. So this tells me uh, that this process, uh, so the motion of M around a lattice site picks up a berry phase. I should get back to sort in a bigger space. <laughs> so important. <laughs> uh, motion around the lattice site. Of minus one to the two S. Because for each S boson, I pick up a factor of minus one. And therefore, there's a very phase where this um, instanton picks up a, this M particle picks up a minus one as it tunnel around in the closed loop. Okay. Sorry, I'm, I'm yeah. mostly confused, but yeah. the, the position of the original branch cut is somewhat arbitrary, right? Yes. So why can't you rotate the branch cut as well? Why you rotate M? So, no, so when you do a very phase calculation, there's a certain gauge ambiguity in the very phase. Uh, because the phase of the wave function is not well defined. Uh, so when very phase, to, to unambiguously define a gauge invariant very phase, uh, you make a closed loop in parameter space yeah. where the Hamiltonian comes back to itself and is in the same gauge. And then there's a gauge invariant factor left over, which is the phase you picked up in that half. So as you go this loop and you come back, the Hamiltonian has come back to itself up to a gauge transfer. So you have to do the gauge transformation to compute the gauge invariant contribution of very phase. No, this I understand. I guess yes. I'm asking like why every time that you hop around this M, yeah. why are you just slightly modifying your branch cut rather than, for example, just rotating it so that at the end it comes back to your the original one right away? You can do that if you want it. <laughs> but still, it would still, still be true. It'll still be true. You would you would be forced to do a gauge transformation on every side you circulate. In fact, in general, if you go around some big loop, you'll pick up a minus one to the number of sites times to s that you enclose. So I'm going to put this all in much more familiar terms for field theory and uh, for field theory in a little while, maybe not today, but definitely by next lecture. But if you are uh, looking ahead, what we'll see is that this is described by an Isengage theory uh, and this M particle is just a pi flux in the Isengage theory. Uh, and the S particle, have charge one, D2 charge one, 
Uh, and so when you move a pi flux around the charge one, you pick up a factor of minus one, basically. <laughs> uh, uh, but this is, you know, turns out to be really crucial because these phase factors that are given by background density of matter uh, for all these constraints that we've been talking about, like, uh, you know, half integers. Uh, systems, you cannot have a trivial model insulator. Uh, the Lertinger theorem for Fermi surfaces, these are all in the same family of constraints. And this is, in fact, the simplest one of them. And you can see just by a few pictures, you can, you can derive it. <laughs> so is this similar to the one you, the phase factor you derived before when an S goes around an M? No. That? no. This has to do with uh, uh, symmetry, that the number conservation of the S bosons on each side. Uh, the other one was purely topology. Topo topo uh, I will rephrase this in terms of translational properties of Wilson lines and Artuft lines in a Z2 gauge theory, how they transform under translations. Uh, so it's very much associated with translations and U1 symmetry uh, charge in this case. Uh, but you can also define it in the Z2 gauge theory you know, in a simpler way. Whereas the other one, this, this is purely nothing to do with symmetry whatsoever. This phase factor will be present in any system, uh, uh, any Z2 gauge theory, any toric code. This doesn't exist in a toric code. You can't even define what S is in a toric code. Okay, <laughs> I, I see some puzzled faces. Uh, just, just wait a little bit. I think this will become clearer. So, any questions online? I mean, another way to say there is a connection, if you wish, between this and this. Uh, here we took an E particle around M, and here we took M around a lattice site. But the special feature of this antiferromagnet that each lattice site has an E particle in it. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. So, but that's that's a special feature of this model. It's not generally true. <laughs> so there's a background density uh, that we have to worry about, and and that gives you this extra phase factor. And this is, you know, in the conventional application, this is absolutely crucial. Uh, without this, uh, you would just get the wrong type of uh, spin liquid. <laughs> All right, um, okay, I'm almost done with this. So finally, another E particle moving around the M, and this phase factor, the M particle picks up around the lattice site, and the M particle moving around, um, I can also form uh, the epsilon particle, so, uh, which is the final thing I need to do to completely complete this description. Um, so now the, the E particle and the N particles uh, are present, perhaps in, in some world, or by, by tuning the coupling between them, uh, they can form a bound state. And that bound state is called the epsilon. E and N. Okay, so, so here's an EM bound state. Um, there's another EM bound state. So these have branch cuts, let's say they go wrong this way. <laughs> uh, and now you can ask what happens when you move this bound state uh, around the other one. So you take this particle here, this bound state, uh, and you, you move it here. And that corresponds to an exchange of the two of them. Okay, so as you're moving this, sitting here, uh, it's got this branch cut going out, and that branch cut is going to cross the E somewhere, and so this tells us that you're going to pick up a minus one as you move halfway around. Okay, so minus one. This process leads to a minus one, and that implies the epsilon is a fermion. Um, and since the M has spin zero and the epsilon has spin a half, 
uh, this also has, in this case, it's been, it's fractionalized and has been a half. <clears throat> so I started with theory with just ordinary spins, and I wrote it in terms of these Schrodinger bosons. Um, and then I found saddle points, I found these non trivial saddle points with the ends. Uh, I had an S particle, an M particle, a non epsilon particle. And this epsilon particle is a fermion. So I've got a fermion out of just bosons all the way through. So that's also quite remarkable. Now, what's been done since then, uh, especially from very nice work by Ashwin Vishwanath, is that this thing, this epsilon particle, is in fact nothing but uh, the Schrodinger fermion, which we're going to play a lot with in the next set of lectures. In other words, instead of writing the spin here in terms of Schrodinger bosons, um, I could also have written it. I could have done the same, I could have taken the same model. Uh, and then a different mean field theory uh, where I've written S the some fermion F dagger alpha, sigma alpha, beta over two, beta. So I get two different descriptions of the same Hamiltonian. One with bosons, has spin I have bosons, and the other with spin I have fermions. Then I work very hard with these two descriptions. I get different saddle points. I figure out all the quantum numbers of the E, the M, and the epsilon. This is also what turns out to be exactly the same structure, uh, but you have to just replace bosons with fermions everywhere. Uh, so I get two different saddle points with all kinds of the same quantum numbers uh, of topological quantum numbers, E, the one, the one, the E, the epsilon, the M. But I also have to look at various other symmetries, like translational symmetries, lattice rotative symmetries, parity, time reversal, and so on. Uh, and in many cases now there's a classification that these are actually different descriptions of the same theory. So you can start with theory with, with the epsilon particle or you can start with theory with E particle. You end up with the same theory. Uh, of course, you know, one approach may be better than the other depending on which is the lower energy excitation or whether this bomb state even exists in principle or not. <laughs> yeah. For this equivalent, I'm assuming that for the bosons, you had one boson per per side, so that that orange S on the right corner is. Uh, yeah. So again, you also have the same constraint on the fermions. Uh, in this case, oh sorry, it's only work for spin and half. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You have to put more colors on the fermions to get higher than uh, other spin. Right. Right. But then you would have other degrees of freedom. Too. Yeah, but uh, it's still uh, pretty sure it's possible, even for higher spin, to map boson theory to fermion theory. So this is a, a simple but you know, proven example of fermion boson duality in uh, two plus one dimension, uh, where uh, well, no, it's not completely proven, but it's very, very plausible. Uh, there's a few things about the spectrum of the M particles that haven't really been matched. Uh, but we fully expect them to match. Uh, where you can start with a theory with either bosons or fermions, but Fortunately, you end up in the end with the same state in some invariant sense. And this is very nice because in the early days of studies of thin liquids, uh, there were a lot of arguments between people using this point of view versus this point of view. Uh, and so we know that in most cases, they were talking about the same thing. <laughs> All right. Okay, so that's you know my very sketchy approach to just showing you how you can at least by waving your hands quite a lot do that path integral over Q and how you get all the structure. But I want to do a little better. Uh, now, of course, that path integral is is really complicated, so we're going to have to simplify life a little bit uh, and uh, write down some simpler model, which we hope will capture all of the same physics and. Uh, a lot of evidence that it does. And the purpose of doing this a bit better uh, is all we have shown here is the stability of this C2 spin liquid. You, you know, it seems to be nothing dramatic going on. You've got some new particles around, but nothing has really destabilized the ground state. Um, but eventually, you know, as the fluctuates, as you get lots and lots of n particles, so let's, 
the imagine a situation where you get m. What does the m particle correspond to? The m particle corresponds to a flip in sign of q across a bash part. So as you're getting lots and lots of m particles, then you're getting lots of these uh, these fluctuations, these flux, this this pi flux associated with each uh, each m particle is obviously very detrimental to the original saddle form. So eventually, when the density of quantum fluctuations of m particles become very large, uh, you can imagine that there is a transition to where the flux is not well defined. Uh, flux fluctuates so strongly uh, that you get what's called confinement. So that's what we want to describe now, uh, is the confinement transition of, these, of this phase of matter. Okay. All right, so, so we have this pattern equals the Qs and lambdas to do. Uh, and what we want to approximate it in a way that preserves all these saddle points. At least the saddle points, uh, the set of saddle points is the same. Uh, and we also want to add, but you know, but the actual tunneling matrix I'm going to change. Uh, but of course, no problem, we haven't computed them anyway. Uh, we want to preserve uh, the set of saddle points. And we also want to preserve this property uh, that every time an M particle moves around uh, side, it picks up a very phase of minus one to the two S. Okay, so we want to write down some simplest theory which have these features, the same set of saddle point and the same very phase. And we're going to imagine that the E and the epsilon particles really high energy. Uh, those we don't worry about, they're gapped. Uh, but the M we want to worry about because it's only the M uh, that destabilizes the original saddle point. There. Yeah, right. Introducing all these fluxes that weren't there to begin with. Okay. So the approximation we're going to make is we want to replace each qij uh, by a new variable, which I'll call sigma zij, which will be plus or minus one. So, and the reason is obvious. I mean, everything we had to do with the fluctuations of q and the creation of m, the most important thing they did was change the sign of q, at least out here. You know, what's happening in the core, we can't capture, but we give up on that. That only happens in some small region. So let's uh, try to forget about that and just keep track of the sign of Q. All right. So now you had a gain symmetry. Uh, we want to keep that. Um, so the gain symmetry now will be sigma zij uh, goes to sigma z. Uh, ij times, uh, I forget what I used in my notes, uh, zeta i zeta j, with zeta i is plus or minus one. So whatever theory we write down for these sigma zij, um, we should be invariant under this, this very simple gauge transformation. Uh, this is therefore a z2 gauge theory. Just as u1 gauge theory changes thing by phase, here we're making life simple by this restricting to Z2's part of it. And the ultimate justification is that all the interesting saddle points that we're interested in only had a, a, a change in the sign of Q far from the core. Uh, or on the, in the torus that was also explicitly true everywhere. So we just focus on that part that has all the interesting non-local structure that we're interested in. And all the other uh, fluctuation, the phase of Q, we, and so on, they all seem to be gapped, like the spin-offs. Sorry, can you repeat again? Like the, this gauge transformation, are you, you're imposing it, you're deriving it from the Q? We're well, going to write down some action for sigma z now, or in fact, a Hamiltonian. Uh, and that Hamiltonian uh, better be invariant under this gauge set. But why specifically this gauge symmetry is the angle, sorry. Well, it's the, it's, once we restrict Q to be real, uh, and just equal to plus or minus one, then the original gauge transformation, which is qij, went to qij e to the minus i rho i plus rho j. So there's still some life left in this because rho i can be zero or pi. 
So just as I restricted Q to be real, uh, then I'm forced to restrict rho i to be zero or pi. You're squeezing it on the, everything on the real axis. Yes. So this this zeta i is just e to the i rho i. And all the others Qs we assume we to get. But we have to keep track of the Z2 part because that's what appears uh, as a flux in the in the bison. Okay. Then what about so so there's the sigma z, but what about some actual quantum mechanics? Uh, things are going to fluctuate. Let me delete this here. <laughs> Uh, one other term in the action that I haven't at all mentioned so far, but would be needed to compute some of these instantons. Uh, for each QIJ, I had an action. I'm now going to assume Q is real, something like this, just for IJ side. This is my Lagrangian uh, B of QIJ. Um, so this particular action, you know, has. Uh, so we assume the magnitude of Q takes two possible values. So we rescale the Q so that this is Q equals plus one, and this is Q equals minus one. Uh, and this is V of Q. So we rescale Q so that there's a minimum here at plus one and minimum here equals minus one. And that's of course what's mentioned, measured by sigma Z. So there's some, okay. I have these two possible states I have to keep track of. But what I just told you earlier, there's also a tunneling between these two. So there's a tunneling operator that can take you from here to here. And that instant on the effect of that, uh, you compute from this kinetic energy term. So there'll be some splitting. Um, and I'm going to call that splitting uh, 2G. Okay, so the only thing I want to keep track of again is the fact that this sigma z can flip uh, back and forth. Uh, and if I just had one bond, uh, it'll, be, it'll cost me an energy 2G. All right. Okay, so now we're almost ready to write down our rather drastic approximation to the original path integral over to Q. So we're going to say that there's a, a theory here. H equals, well, so we, we want a potential energy term. So we already had a potential energy term which is product of Q, Q around closed loops. So we just take the simplest closed loop and I'm going to put things in the square lattice now, but you can put it on any lattice. So it's minus K and product, let's say on, on L belonging to a square because I'm on a square lattice of sigma z l. So this is just product of q's, q and q star that I had before, and I replace q by plus or minus one, and just keep the very simplest loop, not all of them, just a simple one, and there it is, okay. And then I have uh, uh, this thing fluctuating back and forth, that's gonna give me some quantum mechanics uh, with split, this is with energy, uh, G, so that'll be minus G on every link of the lattice. And I'll put a sigma X operator with someone else. So that's my Z2 gates theory, which I claim has uh, almost all of the features in terms of the structure of the saddle points and the tunneling between the saddle points um, as the Q lambda path. Uh, it's simplified a great deal. This is the main simplification you made. This is really the only quantum coloring process you're accounting for. Uh, nevertheless, you'll find this is sufficient. Now this Hamiltonian is sufficient to even make uh, the bosons move around. And in this particular Hamiltonian, you can even compute the energy and the mass of the bison and everything in certain perturbation theory. Uh, X uh, gauge invariant? Uh, yes. So. Sigma X it does not is gauge invariant object. Yes. So I've chosen a gauge. So this thing uh, 
yeah, this is only an invariant of time independent gauge transformation. So I picked a gauge where I uh, fixed everything in time. Uh, and so you just rotate this qubit uh, by 180 degrees about the x axis. So that's the gauge transformation that leaves sigma x in there. So if this is z and this is x, uh, you perform an NC2 rotation, but this goes to minus c. So you rotate by 90 degrees about this axis. Nothing happens to x. The so signal x is invariant. So there is a unitary transformation. This is a unitary transformation. So let me write it out here. Sigma x on my j goes to sigma x. This is the gauge invariant structure of the theory. It's invariant under this transformation. And this is unitary uh, because you can perform a rotation of uh, 180 degrees about the x axis and sigma z will go to minus sigma z, but sigma x won't change. Uh, sigma y will change, but there's no sigma y in the animatronic. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. Yes. So, uh, we are ignoring the lambda terms because it won't be uh, what you say, not it's gauge invariant, but it would be a constant like term. Yes, I've chosen a gauge where I don't worry about lambda, um, but that's actually a very important point. I'm now going to worry a little bit about lambda because it was the fluctuations of lambda when you perform them exactly that gave you this constraint of s dagger s equals 2s. And that gave us this, uh, this constraint here, that the motion of m around the lattice side picks up a very phase of minus one to the 2s. Okay, so I'm just going to give you a state of condition and maybe uh, certainly next time we'll actually do a computation and verify this. Okay, so now let me just give you a condition. So well, this particular Hamiltonian um, has what we call as a Z2 gauge symmetry. Uh, another way to say that uh, is got an infinite number of conservation laws. There's an infinite number of operators uh, that commute with the Hamiltonian. So these are the gauge charges, or this, this is something called Gauss's law uh, in electrodynamics. Uh, so the analog of Gauss's law is the following statement. So for each lattice site, this is a site I here, uh, notice the, these, these qubits of the sigma z variables are sitting on the links. So I have sigma, sigma here, sigma here, sigma here, sigma here. So these are sitting on the links. So for each lattice site I, I define the following operator. This product on L belonging to I, meaning that L ends on I, of sigma x i, of sigma x l. So I pick a lattice site and I take the product of sigma x around uh, on that lattice site. If I was doing this in a U1 gauge theory, I'll get uh, the exponential of the electric fields. And this will be the divergence of the electric field gives you the charge. So this is the gate charge, uh, which is this sigma x, measure the Z2 gate charge. Okay, so now this operator commutes with this Hamiltonian. Again, uh, very easy to check. First of all, most importantly, of course, it computes with this. But why does it commute with this? Because sigma z uh, does not commute with sigma x. So now the important point is that whereas sigma z uh, does not commute with sigma x, it does anti-commute. Sigma z, sigma x is minus sigma x, sigma z. So if I take this loop, this, this packet here, uh, and at this one, so this is this is my plaquette. And so I'm gonna take product around this of sigma z uh, on this plaquette. Or you can take, if it was a plaquette far away, of course it can yours, but this is the only dangerous one. And now what we notice is that this sigma z uh, anti-commutes with the sigma x. This sigma z anti-commutes with that sigma x. Uh, and therefore, this whole thing commutes. So you can just check uh, that GI commutator to Hamiltonian is zero. We have an infinite set of conservation laws, which corresponds to an infinite set of 
Z2 symmetries, these 180 degree rotations. Uh, and that's what we call the gate symmetry. So there's a Z2 gate symmetry. Uh, these are the symmetry transformations. Uh, and they lead to an operator that's generated by this G, uh, which commutes with the Hamiltonian. This only works on the square lattice? No, it works on any lattice. Okay. Yeah, everything I'm going to say will work on any lattice. <laughs> Because if you had a triangle plaquette, then you'd have three minus size, right? Uh, it doesn't matter as long as the, uh, uh, you know, if it's a closed loop, it's going to go through this any lattice side an even number of times. You only care about these two. Oh, I see. Uh, in the original theory, I had only even number loops, but this I could even put it on a triangle with all number of loops, it still works. Yeah, just take on any lattice. As long as because a closed loop, it's a closed loop here. Uh, it is always an even number of links ending at every point on the loop, even though the total number of links may be odd. Okay, so this is it's got an infinite set of Z2 gate charges. So now if this is uh, operators that commute to the Hamiltonian, I have to tell you what the value of GI is. I have to give you the value. Uh, uh, it's not something I determine in the priority. There's a set of Hilbert, there's a Hilbert space here, uh, and then a spectrum on the Hamiltonian for each values of GI. And of course, the square of this is one, so we know the eigenvalues of GI are plus or minus one. Um, so I have to tell you I mean, for each lattice side, what is GI? Is it plus one or minus one? And if you give me some set of gate charges, uh, I'm going to get uh, a different spectrum for this theory. All right, so oh, I'm not interested in the I think general gate theories, so you could study it for general GI. I'm interested in this particular Hamiltonian. Okay, so now what we notice is that, what do we have? Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's not obvious yet. I will show it eventually. Uh, so we have exactly two S gate charges electric charges on each lattice side. Uh, and there are no electric charges in Hamiltonian yet. Uh, yeah, maybe that should be the next step. But let me just state the claim. So the claim is that GI on every side for the antiferromagnet must equal minus one to the two S. So this is a, a, a faithful effective theory, which really gets you know, captures essentially all of the, the correct low energy properties of the D2 spin liquid, and also the nature of its phase transitions into confining phases. That's also correctly captured by working with this very much simpler theory. This is the Hamiltonian. Uh, these are, this is this, and this is the sector of the Hilbert space you should work with. It should be exactly, for half integer S, it should be exactly one, uh, Z2 gate charge in the background. All right, let me motivate this a little bit. Let's try to put back uh, these S particles back into the theory. So, how do these S particles, if you want to really worry about them, if you them out? Um, step one, with a big gap, but suppose I wanted to put them back in. How will they appear? Well, we already know how they appear in the original theory. Uh, the Hamilton for the S particles was uh, QIJ star, come over all bonds of epsilon alpha beta, SI alpha, SJ beta. So, what all we have to do is just replace this QIJ by sigma ZIK. Here we have it. And you also see from here that the S particles, SI alpha, under a gauge transformation, uh, go to zeta i times SI alpha. So the, this is this kind of field that has only one zeta transformation is called an electric charge. So the S particles carry an electric charge of zeta, zeta i. So you can define, you have, if you want to really have the G commute with this term, you have to add another factor 
in the G, uh, which does this rotation. Uh, so I won't write that out, maybe because I haven't done it, maybe I'll do it by next time. So the G has to be modified. So I will commute with this term too. Uh, and the G should be such that uh, it performs this particular observation of the S. And so then you see exactly why this has to be minus one to the two S, uh, because under a gauge transformation, we know that there are exactly uh, two S bosons on each side, and each pick of a factor of minus one. Okay, but uh, the way to really prove it, according to things I put on the board, uh, is to find the, the m-particle excitations of this theory and have them do a closed loop on the square lattice. And you'll find you pick up exactly the minus one to the two S factor. Okay, I think there's a good point to pause. I won't go over today, we have a little bit early or open it up for any questions. So just to summarize then, you know, we started with a generic set of Hamiltonians on the square lattice or triangle lattice. And under assumptions on the structure of certain saddle points, we've argued that provided the spin on gap is large, that's really the main expansion parameter here, uh, there is, a very interesting ground state with fourfold degeneracy, and then fluctuations, gauge fluctuations about that ground state are described by this very simple theory uh, with this constraint on the gauge chart. I should say this theory was first written down in this form by, but not exactly this form, in a space time form by Wegener. This is Wegener's Ising gauge theory. Uh, that was 1975, long time ago. Uh, he didn't have this. Uh, on almost great chart in the background. This was the original model for confinement in QCD. Uh, that was his motivation. But what Wegner was describing, and this wasn't something he was aware of in those days, was in fact a topological phase of matter uh, with these four folders that are ground states and all these other properties, the one, the E, the M, and the epsilon. Uh, all of that in principle could have been worked out Maybe it were worked out in those days by various people. Uh, but this part is new. <laughs> That's also needed for a full theory of finite matter uh, systems. Okay, any more questions? All right, I'm sure you're all exhausted like me. <laughs> so I'm going to end early today. <laughs> I was wondering if this minus one. Yeah. If we get it in point code by changing the sign of one term and down one term. Uh, you have to put electric charges uh -huh. in the in the Well, the Tori code does have yeah, it does have electric charges. It's, it's in a certain gauge with electric charges. But you yeah. have to put a background gate charge. Well, I thought you'd accomplish it if you. Could they have had a term in Hamiltonian, which was the Gossel operator? Yes. With a plus sign? Yes. But if you put the same term with a minus sign, then the low energy states would have. Yeah, I, it may well be. I mean, the Tory code has no dispersion, so it's not, yeah. <laughs> the M bar is totally stationary, which is not the case in this yes. particular case. So. <laughs> Maybe I misunderstand. I thought what the Torah code was yeah. was lattice gauge theory, except that there's no gauge symmetry. Instead, you add the what in gauge theory you call the constraint operator, which I think you call G to the uh, I mean, the Torah code has both matter, it has matter fields. It's really lattice gauge theory with Z2 matter fields. 
but you fix the gauge in a certain way. It has matter, it has E particles and M particles. This theory doesn't have any E particles. It's only the S particles or E particles that are gapped up. Well, if instead of imposing a constraint, this G is plus or minus one. Yeah. You added minus G to down the bottom. So energetically, you favor G equals minus one. Yes. But you allow G equals plus one. Yes. That would be a way of including. Yes, I think that's right. Thanks for the lunch. It was really interesting. Thank you.